I was an average run-of-the-mill UXer until uh, one day, 2000, November 2000 happened, and I found myself on a federal advisory committee. Before I got there, I found myself sitting on the stage at the August Chamber of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, listening to a uh, technology advocate and a blind advocate shriek at each other. I don't mean argue, I mean screaming at each other. The rest of us on the panel were tipping the table back and diving behind it. Um, and somewhere along that way, uh, I went from, a, sure, we should do good stuff. You know, UX is good, a facility is good, somebody will make it happen, no worries, to a crazed person. Um, I can talk about elections pretty much indefinitely. I will try not to go rambling off too much. Um, but um, three years ago, we started the Center for Civic Design. We've been working on this stuff for a long time. We made it official. We're now a nonprofit uh, doing projects with uh, election officials across the country and continuing to work on standards. Uh, and our, our approach to this is that we believe that democracy is a design problem, right? That you design the space that you live in, and whether that's a digital space or a physical space or a social space, you design it. So um, without going through a lot of history, I want to think about what the promise of elections was. Um, the 2000 election was one of these big watershed moments when lots of stuff happened and lots of people woke up to a lot of things. But one of the things that happened after the 2000 election was that the Help America Vote Act, which I will now call HAVA, um, was passed in 2002. And among the things that it said was that elections had to be accessible. Uh, they specifically mentioned blind and low vision and said that there would be private and independent voting, um, the same opportunity for access and for participation in elections. Those are the exact words of, this, of the law. Now, the question is then, what did we really get from that? Because the reality is that future is huge, very rarely evenly distributed. William Gibson fairly uh, said that famously. And the present is simply a stopping point on the way to the future. And the reality is, of course, indeed quite um, unevenly distributed. Now, there's some things that have been quite interesting happening recently. So curbside voting, represented by the picture um, that says ring bell for voting assistant, uh, in one way you can look at that is that it's a hideously awful accommodation for a building that is in some way not accessible. Uh, you can sit outside and election officials will come out, a pair of them, with whatever voting apparatus you need so that you can vote from your curbside. Um, there's lots of good things about it, but there's lots of bad things about that. I I'm now hearing in California that they're doing drive-through voting for everyone. Right? So you'll t they'll take a, an abandoned space that's actually got a drive-through space and say, why should anybody have to get out of their car? Drive on through, drop off your ballot, here's, you know, or pick up your ballot and drop it off. And the other maybe more positive thing is that often the accessible voting system is simply one of a number of voting stations, um, or maybe more than one of a number of voting stations in very progressive places. Um, but it's not the same everywhere. And, and let me give you one little piece of sort of background you need to know, which is a lot of people think that the federal government runs elections. They don't. They think states run elections. They don't. Elections are run at the county or in some states at the township level. So for example, in California, the largest county has seven million voters, or seven million people of whom five million or so are voters, and the smallest county has 1,000 voters. Um, you can have very, very different kinds of resources and very, very different kinds of challenges in those situations. Um, and so it is extremely local and extremely uneven. Um, so why is this still so difficult <laughs> in 2006, as Justin Trudeau said, because 2006. So everybody think back to the last time you voted. Was it easy, hard, inaccessible, delightful? How many of you are New Yorkers? How many of you voted on Tuesday? How many of you knew there was an election on Tuesday? Right? <laughs> It's actually one of the bigger problems is that we, we vote a lot. We think of voting as not being something we do once every four years, but we actually vote quite a lot. So even in that quick show of hands, there was a lot of unevenness because you might be in a great district. You might be in a lousy district. You might have a problem. It might be inaccessible to some people, but not to you. So there's all of this unevenness about it. Um, and that's all the bad news. Uh, what I want to do is actually talk about some slightly more promising good news because I think we can all talk about the bad news forever. Um, and, and there's some interesting things happening. Uh, before we go, I want to talk about why elections are so hard. They are what we call a wicked problem, right? A wicked problem is one that is incompletely defined, has contradictory or incompatible requirements, and is changing all the time. And this, in a nutshell, defines elections. 
Um, they are also, the, the requirements that live around elections are really hard. They're critical, right? They are the centerpiece of democracy. So they're critical both because the outcomes are meaningful, but because they're socially critical, they're personally critical. When I do research with voters who are new voters because they're young or because they're new to this country, they can talk for quite a long time about the big picture of democracy and having your voice, and then they will often say, but I don't know what you actually do when you vote. Right? So the mechanics of voting, the what does, it, what does it mean to be a citizen, big picture we got. It's the little picture. What is the daily action that makes us participating citizens in a democracy? So it's critical in all of these ways. It's constrained. There are laws around it. There's budgets around it. Your average county clerk uh, does fights for her budget for elections with the roads department. Do you want the trash picked up or do you want a good election? Well, I'd like both, thank you. But you know, in, in days of budget constraints, that's hard. One election official in the Midwest started saving some of his money out of his budget because he knew he was going to need no, new equipment soon. And they said, no, you can't do that, and took it away from him. Right? So you can't even save up. You can't even, the, the, there are just constraints all around it. Plus, it's a political environment. There's winners, there's losers. Anytime you have winners and losers, there's sore, sore losers and happy winners. It's complex. It's much more complex than we think. I'm still diving into how complex it is. It's complex both in any individual location, and it's complex because it's different in all of the 10,000 jurisdictions that run elections across the country. It's episodic. We do it occasionally. We remember lots of things about it, but it's not something we do every day and build up habits around, although we do remember things. I, I, I actually poll work. Um, if, you don't poll, if you don't work as a poll worker, it's a fantastic thing to do. Um, and they added a, a voting station, and people would come in charging for the one, and they'd stop dead because the wrong thing was in front of them, having remembered that from a year ago. So there's strong memories about how, to, how you interact, but the laws change all the time, more than, much more than we think. They're a little improvisational. Right? Spaces are new. They have to find, every year they have to find spaces. They get set up the morning of election at 4 and 4.30 in the morning. Um, poll workers, if there's a problem, they've got to solve it themselves. Hopefully they've been well trained. So there's this kind of um, get through the day, get the polls open, start collecting votes, get the polls closed on time thing. And cities are diverse, voters are diverse, systems are diverse, issues are diverse. So every election is really a new election. Um, Every election director wakes up on election day with this prayer on their lips, please, Lord, let the margins be wide. Because when the margins are wide, the little differences kind of come out in the wash. When the margins are tight, and they have been since the late 20th century, they're just hard. It makes, it, it exacerbates everything. So when we say that voting's a wicked problem, besides all of that, Look at the things it needs to be. It needs to be usable. Voters have to be able to use it. Poll workers have to be able to set up the stuff. We have to be able to count the votes. I mean, all those things have to work for all the people. The army of poll workers is, about a, t is a temporary workforce of well over a million that is marshaled for the day or a few weeks of elections, and then they go back to their daily lives. And they are long, long days. It needs to be accessible in every possible sense of the word accessible, right? both the most colloquial and the most technical sense. If voters cannot actually get to the polling place, if they cannot actually get to their ballot, if they can't actually mark their ballot, then what's the point of having an election? It needs to be flexible because you know, we might have a hurricane tomorrow. Um, you know, disaster planning is one of the things that uh, election officials spend a lot of time thinking about. What happens if? What happens if the power goes out? I was a poll worker in Sandy. We were in a truck bay because the place we usually have our polling place was being used as a warming shelter for people who still didn't have heat. It needs to be secure. We need to trust that what voters did in the polling booth actually made it to those results, right? That they weren't, the ballot box wasn't stuffed, the votes weren't changed, people weren't locked out or given incorrect information um, to vote wrong. And all of those things do happen because here in this country we have a very rich, rich history of voter fraud, uh, actually election tampering, I would say more than voter fraud. It needs to be audible. If we challenge the election, we need to be able to find out what actually happened. It needs to be affordable. We could have the Rolls-Royce of polling system. We'd have one polling station in a very, very long line. And it needs to be robust 
all done with a secret ballot, taking away the most usual unit of audit. So the, the argument about bank, you know, banking, you know, if, you get, if your credit card is mischarged, you get to see it, we can talk about it. But once you cast that ballot, it's disconnected from you. How do we know which ballot it was? So when there's a problem, how do you recover from that problem? So in that horrible context that I adore, Lots of things have happened as we've tried to fix things and advocate that I think are really unintended consequences. Um, one of those things is based on some assumptions. Hava says that every polling place must have at least one accessible voting station. Um, then in an effort to be kind of, um, to make it easier, they said that, po that single polling station has to serve every disability. <laughs> So it's a pretty big design challenge. Um, and uh, the, but there were other assumptions. One assumption was that we'd be voting on things with electronic screen, that there would be voting stations, right? That there'd be polling places. We have at least three states so far that ha don't actually have polling places much. And um, that there's a fairly narrow view here of what accessibility means. And that's partly because of who was in the room, which goes back to many of the discussions we've had during today, right? The blind and low vision com community was in the room drafting those regulations. The mobility community is largely concerned with polling place physical access. Uh, but no one said, whoa, what about cognitive? What about, you know, there's all the what abouts. And when you start actually saying everyone, the word everyone, and you mean it not in a vague aspiration way, but in a kind of mathematical way, then it gets even harder. Um, the next unintended consequence was what I call self-segregation. We've been talking a lot about no segregation in the polling place, going back to the discussion a couple of sessions ago about rights, right? That when we talk about, uh, when we say we don't want to be, have our own machine, but people started saying, well, that's the accessible machine. It's our machine. No one else should use that machine. Well, we can all, I think we see enough smiles around them to think that we know what the problem with that is. The more people who use that system, the more likely it is to be ready, to be set up, to be used. The more secret your vote is because the fewer votes there are sitting on, on or near that machine or connected to that machine. And also, we know that lots of people who do not identify as disabled um, would be vastly helped. If you do not speak English well, if you do not read well, a good audio track would be very helpful. Maybe you've only heard the you know, radio and TV, and TV ads and you've heard that name said but not spelled. Would you know who Whitney Quisenberry is as someone with a crazy last name, right? <laughs> um, so uh, instead of saying, yeah, let's make this broad and get demand for it from a lot of voters, and if you have very small polling places, there may or may not be one of any of the X disabilities in that polling place. And how many times do the, polling, you know, the poll workers set up that machine, see no one use it, and think, hmm, maybe I won't do it. On the other hand, I have done a lot of election observations, and one was in, in Minnesota, where they are indeed Minnesota nice. <laughs> and they were very excited because before I left, we're not allowed to be in the polling place during the day. And before I left, they said, oh wait, don't leave because we have a blind voter and he's going to be coming in any minute. And they were really excited because it really was set up and it really was ready and they knew him by name. And they were just, you know, it was like, and he's part of our community. We want to show you that we know this. And it was kind of sweet, right? Um, and the last one is that we have this real challenge about competing rights. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I'll be happy to talk to anybody afterwards about the, the challenge of, um, the, the, of electronic voting. Um, and I don't want to get too far off track on this, but um, paper is, for all practical purposes, inaccessible to a large number of people for a lot of reasons. But it is also durable. And we can, can, we can put it in a box and we can count it two years later if we need to. Um, here in New York City, in the South Bronx, there was a, a, a big district that was reporting 15 to 45 percent overvotes on the ballot. That is, people who had marked their ballot in a way that in, invalidated their votes. This is an extraordinarily high percent. A good percentage is less than 1 percent. So just to put that in context. And uh, we were really kind of shocked. We wanted to see the ballots. And Brennan Center went to, went to court about that. But ballots are not a public record in New York City. And they said, well, it's the South Bronx. They probably just don't want and the next election came around two years later, and they were still very high overvote rates. And we did a bunch of, of big data work. I didn't do it. I suppose I should say some really smart people did it. And you could see the socioeconomic overlay over errors. And finally, 
after the second election, the City Board of Elections agreed to open up the ballots and look at them. And what they found was there were no arts on the ballot. The machines had actually been misbehaving. They were overheating after three or four hours of operation. And so all your testing, which might run them for an hour or so, wasn't showing it. And I'm really convinced that this is what happened. Someone would put their ballot in, and it would come back and say there's an error, and they'd look at their ballot, and they wouldn't see a problem. They'd put it in again, and say they're in the poll work, go, oh, just, there's an override button. Just put it in. And I think their mental model was, it must go in a separate bin, and someone will look at it later, right? Well, that's what an audit is, is somebody looking at it later. And the fact that having had paper ballots, we did not immediately say, my goodness, 15% is a lot of overvotes. So let's see what happened, is to make a mockery of having those, those, those ballots. So, um, and, and on the other hand, if we didn't have those ballots, we would never have known what happened. We would just have known that something went wrong somewhere in the electronics. I don't even have to believe in hacking. How many of you have pressed the wrong thing and destroyed your day's work? Because you <laughs> <laughs> so I don't even have to worry. I mean, I just think it could be computers, you know, bad programming, small programming. There was an election that had to be rerun because there was a limit set on it. We often set limits for the expected number of voters or something around that. And they forgot that they were doing vote centers. And it was set up for one day of voting and it was being used for two weeks of voting. And at a certain point in that two weeks, at the bottom of the screen, it started saying, uh, actually, the middle of the screen, it would say, your vote has been cast. And at the bottom of the screen, it said, bah, 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 some kind of error message, right? <laughs> and what they were saying was, I'm so sorry, there's a buffer overflow, and your vote has just been thrown in the trash. <laughs> and it turned out that the votes in that county, that county, it was a state agricultural commission in North Carolina, were in fact within the margin of victory, and they had to run it again. So. We have had experience with things where, where bad stuff happened and there was no way to recover from it. So with all of this sort of sounding like bad news, what is the path forward? Um, how do we help all of people get to a place where we aren't creating solutions that are limited? We, we hear in both the UX world and in the accessibility world lots about standards, which are very big picture and then don't get quite so obeyed, and lots about one-off projects or two-off projects or growing projects. But we need solutions that will attack this nationwide, um, that will help us get better at it. Um, so there, there are three, I think, things I want to talk to you about. The first is beginning to change, and I'm not going to read all of this, and I'll tell you where, if you're interested in where you can get more of it, um, is, is changing the voting system standards from things that are either based around disability or which are based around function. Because the problem with those is that they're really design standards. They say, we think today here's a good way to do this. And that's nice, but tomorrow a new system comes in and how does it fit into that and does it work? And we discover that that didn't work quite as well as it ought to for, for, for voters. And so what we're working on now in the next version of what is called the VVSG for the Voluntary Voting System Guidelines, these are the federal guidelines that the states adopt, um, is switching from that to principles. And the, the reason we're switching from principles is that let us, let's just have a kind of tiered standard. Um, for the usability and accessibility chapter, which is sort of my home in that standard, um, we're proposing um, five principles. So nice and short. Yes, you like it too? Um, nice, nice and short. And that's because your Secretary of State wants to know, is this thing going to be good for elections? So we can say things like, a voting system should be equivalent and consistent, right? Everybody should have an equivalent voting experience and a consistent voting experience. We might say that one of the important things a voting system ought to do is cast the ballot the way the voter marked it, right? And that they were able to mark it the way they intended to because they understood what to do. Uh, that it's been tested for usability with a wide variety of people and that it meets, if it's web-based or it has any sort of um, browser base to it, that it meets accessibility standards, which we have a perfectly good set of. So why not just use them? Um, and then we can begin to decompose that down into the guidelines that support this so that when we get all the way down to a requirement, we actually know why that requirement exists. And uh, I think this is important for several reasons. One is that the people who test voting systems for conformance to the standard are your basic shake and bake laboratories. They don't know beans about accessibility or usability. I mean, they, they try and they're trying to learn. But basically, they're, they're looking for, you know, does it blow up and is, will, it, will it take the electrical charge and things like that. Oh, and, and by the way, this really complicated field of user experience. Um, so we can start to help them do things like not read a requirement that says don't do things with color alone, 
and not translate that into everything must be black and white, right? which is not a good translation of that requirement. Right? Um, and it will help election officials understand what they're looking for and why something exists in the system. And it'll just begin to tie the whole thing together towards the goals that we have in elections and that we have for the voting systems, which is that they support the act and process of running an election. The other thing I think is that we really need to think about this question of segregation, and it's a big deal. Um, in um, a couple of counties, uh, well, so back up a second, Hava, one of the things Hava did was give out money, uh, a lot of money actually, to buy new voting systems. Los Angeles, the largest um, jurisdiction in the country, uh, took a look at the voting systems out there and said none of these, none of these are any damn good, and none of them will meet the needs of our huge diverse county. The Chicago, the second largest, uh, and New York both support five additional languages. They support 10 plus three others uh, mandated at the state level. Uh, it's seven million voters. They, you know, there's, a, it, it, there's lots and lots of things. They are also the, one of the few places where, where helicopters are involved because they helicopter the ballots back uh, immediately after the election. I want to ride on one of those helicopters one day. Um, uh, but Dean Logan, who's the, the county clerk and registrar recorder and um, head of the election department, have elections in the county, said, we're going to start thinking about this in a principled way. And he spent a couple of years thinking about and doing focus groups and going out and visiting lots of communities and saying, what does a voting system in uh, Los Angeles need to do? And laws got passed to enable him to spend his HAVA money because the HAVA in Cal California law said you can only buy a certified voting system with your HAVA money, but if you're going to design your own, you know, you're caught in a catch-22. And so a bill was passed for him. And um, he started down a process with um, advisory committees. Uh, I ended up, I'm on the technical advisory committee, but I was also running a research project for the Election Assistance Commission and um, ended up helping uh, fund some of the research that helped lead into some of this. And they, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, uh, announced that they had finished the design phase of their work. It was done over the course of a year with the firm IDEO and his really, truly amazing staff. He has a very strong technical staff. And I want to just walk you through some of the features uh, there on the picture that you see. It's a, it's a little kiosk stand on four legs. And Dean gave me the most, most wonderful quotes. He said, I had no idea how many hours you could spend in a meeting talking about the, the durability and size and weight of table legs. But if you want a poll worker to be able to pick it up and you want it to be stored and you don't want anybody to get hurt assembling the things and you want it to be sturdy so that when someone who has low, low muscular control does this and sort of bashes at the, at, the, at the keyboard, it doesn't flip the whole thing over, which is what happened with their first attempt at this. It's got a privacy shield around it, but it's not a big claustrophobic shield. And it's made out of uh, a soft felt-like thing. So it's soft and if you bump into it, it doesn't hurt. We also spent a lot of time talking about angles and bevels and what would help guide someone's hand into the right place without being a sharp edge. In the center of it is a 16-inch screen, big enough to have big text on. Everybody, every voting system will be marked. Every voter will mark their ballot using an electronic screen. Um, next to it, there is a tactile keypad and headsets um, at the ready for everyone. On the other side, there's a printer because what you're given is a blank ballot. Not a blank ballot ready to mark, but a blank, an almost blank piece of paper, because it has the required watermarks and things. And you put it in, and it kind of sucks it into the machine. And you mark your ballot. And when you're, when you're ready and you've checked it, it then prints your ballot. And what it prints is what you're voting for. For president, I'm voting for George and Mary. For mayor, Jim, right? which means that you can take your KNFB reader and you can actually verify your own paper ballot because it's not relying on a filled in circle next to the word, it's actually the word, right? And you can read it, you can hold it up to your face and then when you're ready, it sucks it back into the box that's hanging on the back of the ballot which means that you could vote entirely hands free. Now you can do one other very cool thing with this and that is that in California, voters are asked to do a lot of work um, they are asked to vote in this, this election. They're going to vote on 17 propositions, statewide propositions. Uh, the voter guides that they get, for those who have never seen them, can run to hundreds of pages. Uh, it is studying for a test, boys and girls. And so where do you want to do that? In your five minutes in the voting booth or sitting around your kitchen table talking about it with your family and figuring out what you want to vote for and doing it over a couple of nights? 
And so we send out sample ballots in California, or they send out sample ballots in California, and then we say, mark your ballot, bring it in, and transcribe it, which is a little crazy. And so we had the idea um, that, like, er like a airline boarding pass, maybe you could mark your ballot on an electronic sample ballot, turn it into a QR code, bring that QR code, hold it under this little blob that you can't try tell what it is, it would read it, take you right to the review screen. Maybe you've only marked the measures and you want to go back and vote the candidates yourself. Or maybe, maybe you're being bullied by your family into voting for X and you want to vote for Y. Well, you can make a change now. Tick, tick, change the page. You know, no problems, no coercion. And then you're ready to cast your ballot. Well, think about what that's going to do to lines, right? Because it's a lot faster. Now, this is a full, this is not just a picture. They're working prototypes. They've been working on the code. They're about to let the contract for it. The goal is to start piloting this in 2018 to have it fully operation in 2020. They did things like they thought about how it's stored in the warehouse and how it's packed up and how heavy it is and how it's going to get transported. And it's truly an amazing piece of design work. They also did, over the course of the year, I think they touched some 500 voters in usability tests. They went to language communities. They went to um, disability centers. They went to um, different areas of the city, um, of the county. Um, they really did amazingly good work. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an inspiration for us all. The whole story of that and all of the reports and all of the stuff, more than you probably want to read, but it's all there, uh, transparency after all is at lavote.net slash VSAP. It's VSAP stands for Voting System Assessment Project. Um, and the thing that is exciting about it is not just LA, but there's a pretty good chance if they can manufacture it that um, other people in California will use it. New York State's kind of interested in following this project along. Texas is kind of looking at it in some, some of the counties in Texas. There's a project in Texas, in Austin, that's coming up with a similar design, but they're really focusing on cryptography and how we could actually make it safe to mark our ballots electronically and store them electronically. So this is actually done robustly. Uh, the paper ballot could be eliminated one day um, if, the, if the technology got there. So it's future, it's fu it's future looking. It doesn't guarantee that we've, they thought of everything, but um, lots of stuff went into it and it truly is a universal system. One of the fun things that they figured out was that they actually need three audio tracks. Because there's one audio track if you're not using the screen at all and you're just using the audio on the tactile keypad. There's one if you're using the audio to support the visual reading and you're using the tactile keypad and one if you're using audio plus the screen um, and, and doing touch on the screen. And if you're a semi-literate reader, a speaker of a language they support, there's all sorts of reasons why the audio would be really helpful for you. So uh, that's, that's one of the ones that just I think is amazing. Um, the last one is um, remote ballot marking. Uh, Maryland kind of led the way in this. Uh, they said, um, why can't we, if, if we want to vote absentee, which is what it's called on the East Coast, um, how can we vote if what you send us is a paper ballot? And so they came up with the idea of a, a ballot marking system that you would get online and it would download the, your ballot image too and you would mark it online and you'd print it and you'd send it back. Um, uh, there, were, there are lawsuits over, there are two more, San Mateo County in California and Ohio are also um, proceeding with a system like this and are also in lawsuits about it. And uh, without lawsuits, Oregon, which is a vote by mail state, has had a system like this for a long time, since the time when they sent floppy disks in the mail to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's some real advantages of that because their system, uh, well, I'll tell you that in a second. Um, so all of that's working its way through the court. One of the really interesting things that came out of it was a Department of Justice brief that said, in their opinion, and they do are the enforcers for the ADA, um, that it's not enough to have an accessible voting process. If you have every voting channel, if you have early voting, it must be accessible. If you have polling place voting, it must be accessible. If you have vote by mail, it must be accessible. That all of the options for voting must be available to everyone. And this is actually a pretty big deal. Um, uh, Maryland, just two days ago, uh, the Board of State Board of Elections voted to expand the system to allow anyone who would like to use, to use it. There are lots of issues around this. Um, there are some, uh, some serious security issues about sending your vote back and forth across the internet. Um, and uh, because I work with NIST, I, we got a little money and we put a workshop together. 
And I thought, uh, we, we downplayed this so hard because I thought the risk of failure was really high. But the question was, could we actually come up with a set of guidelines for a remote ballot marking system that would be both secure and accessible? We did it at NFB for the optics. Uh, we had the head of verified voting there. We had a lot of, we had a balanced set of technical experts, of, all, of technical experts, accessibility experts, election officials, you know, a little, a little Noah's Ark of all the people who needed to be in the room. And we spent a day trying to come up with principles. I was pretty sure we were going to get to 445 and the whole meeting would fall apart. But we didn't. And we came up with a set of things. Because what we discovered was that the things that you needed to make it accessible didn't conflict with what you needed to make it secure. They actually nested. In often cases, they, they amplified each other. So for example, one of the ways you could figure out which ballot you're going to download is you could go on and you can type in your name and your voter number and your address. And they could send that to the server exposing your date of birth often in P as, as personal information. And then they could send you back the file. And then when you finish marking it and they want to make up your ballot, they could send all of that back to the server and get it back and send you back a PDF that you would print. Um, and every time we hit one of these technical moments, the guy from Oregon would, and we'd say, it just can't be done. We can't think of a way around this problem. The guy from Oregon would raise his hand and say, we've been doing it like that for eight years. Because here's what their system is. It's simple HTML. It's just an HTML file. Um, they could send it to you on a disk. They could download it. They don't ask you your name. They say, what, what, address, what address ballot would you like? We have no idea who you are. You might live in a big apartment building. Or, you, or if you know that you're ballot type 75, you can say, I'm ballot type 75. I'm in District 75. Um, once you've gotten that downloaded to your machine, you could go into a lead-lined room because uh, no, it doesn't need anything else from the internet. And it doesn't need to send it back to the server because it's just going to print out your choices in a nice, clean, simple thing with a barcode on it. Um, barcode is public specification. The text is just text. Again, you could read it and scan it, and you can mail it back. And uh, so we actually got to this point where we have it. I, I'm really excited by it because I didn't think we'd be able to make it work. I'm also excited by it because it means if you are a public advocate, that you can go and not, and not just say, I want this, but I want this and there's a way forward. You know, there's a way to make it work. Um, there's a way to make it work so that, and you know, head of verified voting helped write this. So they're, they're, they're signed off on it. Um, uh, it's not easy to do. A lot of the systems that people are trying to sell out there don't do this stuff, but there's no reason for it. I don't need a PDF file. And even if I did, I don't need it to be made up at the server. And I, you know, QR code code isn't that hard. Um, the QR code is a double check, and it lets the system read back in certain things. And we could do things like know that we need to know what order the pages are coming out of the printer. So if you're looking for the page where you're going to have to sign, you can find that one. And we want, your, we want an extra blank page to come out so that if you're, someone's helping you, your votes aren't exposed sitting on the printer. And we could think about that process um, and begin to think not about fighting with each other, but how do we take this real, actual human voter need and make it work in the 20, 2016, right? I mean, it's time forward. So I think this is the, the way forward is more work on elegant solutions to wicked problems. It's a design problem. We know what we need to do. We got men to the moon. We can certainly get votes into a voting booth. Um, I have a couple of them. One of the things that we've been doing has been writing uh, design tips in this ser series of 10 books um, that we call the Field Guides to Ensuring Voter Intent. They are sort of all the research boiled down into 10 topics and 10 tips each. I have a couple of copies of the one for accessible information if anybody wants it. They are online in a responsive accessible website, civic design, ooh, not designing, but civicdesign.org slash field guides. Um, and everything else I've talked about is linked somewhere from civicdesign.org or um, except for lavote.net. So if you're interested, uh, take a look. There's more pages than you probably want to read, but there's short versions of it as well, and uh, we're always happy to talk to you. I'm Whitney Q at civicdesign.org. Um, my Twitter is Whitney Q, uh, and we also tweet at civicdesign.org um, on Twitter. So thank you. <laughs> Ooh, I'm sorry I'm over. Um, we have time for one or two questions, and then we're going to wrap up. Separate types of voting facilities for particular people, or how does that interpret? 
Well, well, we always do, we already do. I mean, every everybody has absentee voting, so there's already two ways of voting. No, no, no. But separate is it in a separate booth for one, and then versus others in the polling station for example. Okay, I know you're in New Jersey, and you probably vote on the same thing I do, which is a, an AVC advantage. It's a big, huge, massive. It's a lever machine, electronic lever machine. Um, they're hideous, they're also old, and they can't be replaced, so pretty soon New Jersey is going to be going through that. But in a lot of places, if you're voting on paper ballots, there will be paper ballots and a scanner and one electronic marking system. Um, sometimes it's an electronic vote capture system, sometimes it just marks a ballot that can be cast in the scanner like all the others. Um, uh, and and, and we are more and more allowing convenience voters. There's a, a lot of these systems, a lot of these remote systems were driven actually by military and overseas. There's a law called the MOVE Act, the Military Overseas Voter Empowerment Act. Um, that's, you know, if you live overseas, how do you get your ballot by mail, get it back in time, forget accessibility. This is, let's talk about transit across the ocean. So they started doing blank ballot delivery systems to be able to send ballots overseas, cutting the trip in half, right? Uh, and so once, you've, once you can do it overseas, why can't you do it locally? And so often what we've had is developments that start from a special audience and then kind of grow up and, and once they get proven. The big worry about all of this, by the way, is that will a little tiny election department be able to handle it? During Sandy, um, the election offices in New Jersey were swamped. Um, they just, they, they literally could not handle it. Some of their, their printers couldn't keep up. They were worried that they were losing ballots. Um, so there's a, there's a big, modernization effort that you need to, to make that happen. So, but that's why small pilots are good and we can begin to learn that and, and build on it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Whitney. Thanks. And yes.